Joining us now is Matt Morgan. He's a unique situation in Michigan's first district. Um, uh, Matt, welcome to the program, how are you? Good, Jenk, thanks, appreciate you having me. Yeah, you're in a unique situation, no problem. Great to have you here, brother. Uh, because you are a writing candidate with a really good chance of winning, uh, which does not happen very often. So tell us about um, both why you're a writing candidate and why uh, you stand an excellent chance of winning the primary nonetheless. Right, thanks. Well, the first and foremost, I'm the only candidate left running as a Democrat in the primary. So from our perspective, we, we have a great chance of winning the writing campaign. The reason we were kept off of the primary ballot was because the state of Michigan chose to disqualify our nominating petitions. We had more than 1,500 nominating signatures. That's well over 500 more than are necessary to get on the petition. But uh, the state of Michigan chose to disqualify those signatures on the grounds of a minor technicality. It's something we've been seeing the Michigan Secretary of State Board of Canvassers doing on a regular basis when it comes to contentious issues facing, you know, that are placed on the ballot through uh, petitions. And they've, they've made varied decisions depending on whether they wanna see something on the ballot or not. As the only Democratic candidate running against the freshman Republican incumbent here, uh, they decided not to put us on the ballot, but we're, we're in good shape now. We need a very small percentage of the total number of votes uh, that are cast for the top vote getter at the top of the ticket. So we're gonna get a few thousand of those write-in votes. We're really confident about being able to get that, and that's gonna put us automatically on the ballot in November. Just out of curiosity, because I've never seen a situation quite like this. Uh, how many write-in votes do you need? Is there a minimum you need to be able to win? It's a formula, so we need a percentage of the total number of votes cast for the top vote getter on the day of the primary. So that's 5%. So I need like one in 20 voters, for example, who vote for Debbie Stabenow for US Senate uh, to write me in. So we think that we're estimating that number is gonna be around 3,000, uh, could be as high as 4,000 if we have record turnout, but we have every confidence we're gonna be able to get it. We got a great field organization. We have a lot of wonderful volunteers. We have people who work in the phones. We have over 4,000 commits just from phone banking and door knocking alone. So I'm really confident in this. You know, we got just over a week away and we're gonna be beating the streets, you know, from here on until election day. Well, you're just Democrat. That means, you know, you've, uh, you're you a people powered campaign, no corporate PAC money, uh, probably have a lot of volunteers uh, and, and obviously deeply progressive. So let's, uh, and I found something in your uh, bio that I found fascinating. There's a lot of things that I'm curious about, Matt, in regards to your background. You spent summers detasseling corn and walking beans. What does that yeah. mean? Well, when you grow up in an agricultural community, uh, you know, soybeans and corn are the two big crops in uh, the Midwest in terms of cash crops. And so you walk beans, you basically take a hoe and you walk down the rows of soybeans and you cut out black nightshade and buttonweed, the type of things that can foul up a combine and ruin a, a farmer's yield. Uh, in terms of detasseling, you basically work in a basket, rolling down rows of corn, uh, pulling the tassels off of them because the, that's the way corn reproduces. So you want to, when you want to put hybrid corn uh, you have to have male rows and female rows, so you pull the tassels off of uh, the male rows so that you can get that uh, get that cross hybrid pollinization. You probably don't think so, but a lot of that sounded very dirty. Um, okay, <laughs> so, but uh, I get your farming background though, that's very clear. And you're also a Marine, right? That's right, a retired Marine officer, retired as Lieutenant Colonel in 2013. So what makes you a progressive, Matt? Well, you know, I think that, well, I'll tell you, I was in the Pentagon in 2006, 2007 under uh, Secretary Rumsfeld. I had been to Iraq in 2003. I went back to Iraq in 2007 uh, for another year and I came home uh, feeling lied to. And it really changed my whole outlook. And my wife and I both worked very hard for uh, for Barack Obama in 2008. Um, she was actually uh, a leader in Blue Star Families for Obama. So that's what made me a Democrat. But really, from my perspective, in terms of being a justice Democrat, it comes back to Michigan and coming home and seeing families here. You know, we talk about jobless rates here in Michigan or, you know, across the country. Well, the jobless rates just don't tell the whole story. Um, we have more than half of families that can't survive a uh, $400 uh, un, you know, unprepared for cost. Uh, you know, they're being farther and farther left behind. They can't afford to take their kids to the doctor. You know, and as a Marine, I'll tell you, serving in Iraq, if we had someone who was wounded, we took care of them, whether they were a good guy, a bad guy, or an innocent. And we didn't do that just out of the goodness of our hearts. We did that because that was the law of land warfare. That was international humanitarian law. And so when it comes to healthcare and taking care of people, I believe the United States should be doing at least as good as international humanitarian law, if not far better. Wow, that's a great way of putting it, man. I never thought about it that way. 
I thought you were gonna go in a different direction, which, but they're, that was powerful. Uh, because I've talked to other people, whether they're uh, just Democrats or they're uh, w part of Wolfpack, which is to get money out of politics, that are veterans. And they say, look, I didn't go to fight for freedom in other countries and to come back and, and not have freedom here and not have democracy because it's drowning in money in politics. Is that something that also animates you? Absolutely. You know, we're in addition to being a justice Democrat, we're endorsed by In Citizens United. It's something we absolutely have to do. I mean, I live here in the uh, the state of Betsy DeVos. Uh, my uh, the the incumbent has taken uh, tens of thousands of dollars in individual contributions just from the DeVos family. Very proud of the fact that what we've accomplished is is you know taking building a strong campaign. We've over the cycle we've raised nearly eight hundred thousand dollars, almost purely on individual contributions, small dollar donors, and that's allowed us to compete directly with a freshman incumbent Republican who takes tens of thousands of dollars in PAC money to the point that we actually even outraised that freshman incumbent over two quarters. And for the entire cycle, in terms of individual contribution, we've outraised him almost seven to one. No, nah, man, they're, they're guys like Matt across the country. I don't know how in the world you guys raise $800,000 from small donors in a, in a district like Michigan One, where you know basically written off by the Democratic Party, and, and you found a way to coalesce those. And by the way, Michigan, the progressives of Michigan are unbelievable. You guys are the best organizers in the country. I mean, in every bracket I've seen, it's it's amazing. I don't know what's in the water. Well, I say you do know what's in the water. It's really bad, but that's what made, maybe motivates you guys. Um, okay, but let's let's talk about one other thing that that's a high priority for you, uh, which is infrastructure. So, what, what's your plans for that, Matt? Well, one of the things that you know we're talking about money. The, the only PAC money I've taken is from organized labor. We're talking about iron workers, pipe fitters, laborers, operating engineers, and these are men and women who are ready to get back to work. Uh, we have you know the infrastructure in northern Michigan is crumbling, uh, and it's not just roads and bridges. Uh, we've also got a serious issue as it relates to uh, internet broadband penetration. We've got these rural communities that are just falling off the grid because they can't get access to the internet. Now, we've seen the model in the past under the New Deal and rural electri electrification gives us a model to be able to get uh, internet out to these effective communities that the government's just willing to partner and invest in that. It's the only way we're gonna be able to continue to educate our kids, attract new businesses, and to keep the businesses we have. But one of the key pieces that I wanna to point to is a, a, a piece of critical national infrastructure, and that's that's called the Sioux Locks in Sioux St. Marie, right on the St. Mary's waterway between Lake Superior and Lake Huron. A great deal of commerce, hundreds of millions of dollars passes through those locks on freighters uh, from the mines in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan and Minnesota over through those locks and down into Lake Huron and coal moves its way back up through to power a lot of power plants there. Uh, if those locks were to fail, uh, we'd, we'd suffer 11 million jobs lost in Michigan. And that's not my numbers, that's the Department of Homeland Security's number. Uh, those locks were originally authorized to be uh, expanded, repaired in 1986. But Congress hasn't found the money for it ever since then. In fact, Congress just had to pass a reauthorization bill to fund the repair of the locks because now it costs twice as much to repair as it would have then. And I promise you, if Congress were to find the money to fix those locks, you would have every iron worker, laborer, and operator in the Midwest coming up here to work on that project to be a massive job creator. The problem is Congress hasn't been able to find the money for it because their priorities are messed up. You know, I always point to the fact that the president moved the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, uh, which was a completely unnecessary and provoking uh, foreign policy decision, which created a $1 billion construction project that will create zero American jobs. You know, $1 billion would repair those locks and create thousands of American jobs and repair critical infrastructure that is necessary to keep the US economy functioning. Matt, you're an awesome candidate. Uh, so I, I gotta ask you one last thing, and we're out of time here, but real quick. How, how Republican is this district? It's an R plus what? R plus six. Oh Big my Republican. God, you're gonna be a congressman. So we're, we're, we feel very good about it. We have a no-show freshman congressman who hasn't done anything for the district. He doesn't campaign, he doesn't like to talk to people. So we're out there shaking hands, meeting voters, and we're working our butt off, and it's not gonna stop until November. No, look, it, we got a wave coming, and it's a big, big wave. In an R plus six, a guy who's a good enough candidate to raise $800,000 from small donor do donations, and, and, and has this kind of fire in his belly, uh, Matt, I can't wait to see you in Congress. 
So, Thanks, Jake. I appreciate the time. Yeah, Thanks. man. Look, I'm going to give everybody the the links here. Look, the way that uh, people like Matt Morgan win is uh, if you help them. So Matt Morgan for Michigan.com. The other guys got corporations on their side. They got big donors on their side. You you fight for Matt. Matt's going to fight for you. That's how you volunteer. That's how you donate. We'll have all the links below if you're watching later on YouTube or Facebook. Uh, Matt, uh, I'll see you in Washington. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it.